Well, good morning. Welcome to our parenting class, just the second week out of the 14 weeks we have planned. Uh, this is an unusual week uh, because uh, I did this lesson on Sunday, but unfortunately we did not have all the video and audio things in place, and so I am basically redoing this lesson for uh, the sake of those who are unable to watch it on Sunday morning uh, and who come and listen some other way. Uh, I really want to help you and each of our weeks, and I hope you'll tune in every week, we begin with answering some questions that you turned in. Uh, this week we only have one just because of the nature of our lesson last week. You guys have turned in a lot of questions. Uh, most all of them are linked to uh, discipline, and so we will get to those eventually. Uh, we will only stick to answering questions uh, linked to what we taught the week before. Uh, here's the question. How do we handle our in-laws who don't respect our authority but want to babysit our children? Uh, that depends on what your in-laws are attempting uh, to do. Are they trying to get you to parent in a way that's more consistent with the Bible or less? Uh, remember, the final authority is never what you think or what your parents think. The final authority uh, is what the scriptures teach, what our creator has taught us about uh, parenting. Uh, and so you just have to be honest. Uh, is God trying to get you maybe to see something to parent in a more biblical way through your in-laws? Or maybe Satan is trying to influence you to get away from parenting in a more biblical manner. Uh, you need to figure out what, what's going on. And, you know, you need to have a heart to obey God first. So if your in-laws are trying to do, uh, get you to do something that's more like how our Creator wants you to do it, you need to humble yourself and, and change your ways, even if it means agreeing with your in-laws, which, you know, most people don't want to do. Uh, on the other hand, if they're trying to get you away from something uh, that God would have you do, uh, then the, if it's a serious enough issue anyway, then the biological child uh, needs to uh, talk to their parents, you know, uh, just like I taught you in your marriage class. Uh, you need to pick a clear issue or two. Uh, you need to make the situation a matter of prayer. You need to pick a good time need to pick a good tone and have the conversation. Uh, listen, uh, life is filled with hard conversations and we're all going to have to have some of them if we're going to be what Christ wants us to be. And so uh, do that. Uh, don't expect them just initially to say, wow, thank you for correcting me. But you need to do what is right for your own home. When you got married, the most important earthly relationship you have became you and your spouse, and the most important home, your home. Not you and your parents, not the home in which you were raised. And so make sure you use the authority God delegated you uh, in your home the right way. Because, because technically, uh, when you have a babysitter, when you drop your kids off at school or send them something at a, at a church, you, what you're doing is you're taking some authority that God delegated to you as a parent and you are delegating that to, to someone else. And so you need to be uh, in an ideal world. You're working together with uh, that person or, you know, that group to uh, have boundaries, you know, that you're both fine with. Uh, and certainly, as we begin our thought for today, it takes more than love and good intentions to train our children right in the day and age where Christ has placed us. Uh, a couple of thoughts to ponder. As we start this week, uh, here's the first one. We can never know or understand the love of a parent until you become one. And I think uh, those of you who are parents uh, get that. You know, when you used to think all oh, these parents were just hyper, uh, now you're hyper. Uh, here's the second one. When there's a battle of wills between you and your child, always win that battle. And it's one of the most difficult and yet one of the most important thoughts on parenting. Now you're going to have situations where you go to battle your will against theirs and you finish up and you think to yourself, well, I'm never going to fight over that again. It wasn't worth it. But when you have a battle of wills, 
always win that battle. Uh, number three, uh, be careful that you only break the will of your child instead of breaking their spirit. And we, of course, will talk about that more in coming weeks when we spend three weeks on discipline. Uh, as always, uh, I just tell you, I don't have all the answers. Uh, I just am someone who has seen a lot, been through a lot, uh, <laughs> including in my own house, and I'm someone that wants to help you. And I believe our Creator has the answers. I believe He is the ultimate parent, uh, God our Father in heaven. And I think that He has given us some great principles for parenting when He entrusted children to our care. Last week we laid the foundation uh, for our parenting classes and uh, for our philosophy of parenting. Uh, God is our Creator. He makes the rules rather than us. And since you and I cannot see God with our eyes uh, today, uh, we cannot audibly hear God with our ears today, uh, God has delegated some of his authority to his written words because we can see and hear that. And then in his word, he has delegated authority to parents over their own children. And this is so important uh, that God likens himself as our creator to a heavenly father, the image of a parent. Because here, here's a foundational issue. Does God really know what will produce a better life for my child than I do or anyone else does? And the answer for that is clearly yes. Yeah. Sometimes people have this idea that God knows what he's talking about in the Bible when he's talking about how to live forever, but we don't pay any attention to what he uh, is telling us about life. Uh, listen, our Father in heaven knows what it takes to have a good and a meaningful life also. Uh, last week, uh, we closed with the question, uh, since God has given parents authority over our own children, what is the first thing we should teach them? It's a great question. I mean, no one would argue that there are many things uh, as a parent that we ought to teach our children over the years, but what should be first? Where do I start? Now, some people would say, first, teach them to be themselves. Others would say, first, teach them to love. Still others would say, uh, first, teach them to accept instead of judge other people. Uh, still other people would say, teach them to be true to their own heart. And obviously those messages are all over the map and with so many different messages and focuses being taught to parents and parents teaching them to children, even by Christians, it's no surprise there's so many messed up people in our world and that there are a lot of messed up people in our churches. In fact, we see the byproduct of messed up parenting all, parenting all over the place, including the church. And it's a good time just to remind uh, everyone that the church is not a place for perfect people, uh, if there is such a thing, and I don't think there is. The church is a place for people who want to be better than they are now. And I hope that's why you're here today or listening in today. Unfortunately, what we're going to talk about today, even though I think the scriptures teach this should be first, uh, in the minds of many people, including some Christians, uh, this is not first and sometimes non-existent. should have your Bible out and uh, open to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Let's read verses 1 through 3 together. It says, Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you. And by the way, remember, that's the three basic divisions of the law of Moses. And if you don't understand these divisions, you're never going to properly uh, apply and understand the law of Moses. Uh, some of the things that are in the law of Moses were for the civil government. God was establishing a government when he brought Israel out of slavery. Some of the things uh, that he told them were for their religion, for Judaism. And uh, we know, of course, 
Because of the New Testament, those were fulfilled in Christ. Other things uh, that are in the law of Moses, they're moral commandments, and they are based on the character of God, and those are just as active uh, as today as they were uh, back then. Uh, but as we continue in verse 1, it says uh, that you may do them in the land whither you go to possess it. Uh, note, notice that these commandments are not only not suggestions, uh, there are things we're supposed to do. I mean, God didn't just say a bunch of things just to say them. I mean, he expected them to be done. And then God, he made some promises that are associated with obeying his commandments. Uh, his commands are for our own good. I mean, there's no parent here that makes up rules for your children uh, just to ruin their fun. I mean, everything you try to get them to do uh, is for their own good. And God, of course, is a better parent than any of us, and so all his commandments are for our own good. Notice the first thing he says, uh, that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's sons, all the days of thy life, that thy days may be prolonged. Notice God gave them to be kept, not ignored, and he says, listen, you will live longer keeping God's commandments. It's a promise uh, to obeying the commands of God. Uh, what a great promise. Notice also in verse 3, Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it. Notice again, he wants you to do what he's commanding. He's not just talking. He says that it may be well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily as the Lord God of thy fathers has promised thee in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Uh, I mean, listen, who doesn't want it to go well with them? Uh, who doesn't want uh, God to cause what they do to increase? Uh, listen, life is filled with difficulties and valleys. We are broken people living in a broken world. There are lots of ex there, there's lots of pain. One of the things you don't want to do for yourself and for your children is bring extra pain in your life by disobedience to God. Uh, he instead, if we will do what he has commanded, says, you know what? It's going to go well with thee and you will have increase. And, and we all want that for our children. All of us. And in light of these promises, linked to obedience, God wanted and still wants parents to teach their children what God has commanded us. And we pick up in verse 6, says, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Notice not just thoughts, words. It says, And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. Notice you teach God's words diligently to thy children. Notice, uh, and talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. All those things are linked to our own homes and teaching God's word. Verse 8, thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy uh, gates. And you may... Uh, the Jews took that binding them uh, between thine eyes and, and on thy hands. Uh, you, you know, they took that literally. And in fact, Jesus uh, talked about the Pharisees making broad their phylacteries. I mean, it wasn't enough just to have this external uh, little capsule with uh, this section of Scripture and a couple of other sections of Scripture in it. I mean, they made them broad just to let everybody know uh, Listen, uh, we are supposed to teach our children God's words, and it should be obvious in our homes and obvious when we leave our homes that we're trying to obey and uh, know God's words. That's why he said diligently teach them. Uh, this isn't something we're supposed to take lightly. We should be comfortable talking about God and God's words uh, anytime, but sitting in our house, walking outside, lying down, getting up. I mean, constantly. As a parent, we're teaching our children constantly. But by the way, we're not just teaching them when we think we're teaching them. We're always teaching them. 
And because of that, if we're not careful, we'll teach them that the things of God don't matter much except Sunday morning. Because of that, if, if we're not careful, we will teach them that, you know, having the public appearance of obeying God is, is fine uh, or more important than obedience of Christ from our heart. Uh, listen, n- nobody sitting here or listening to my voice would ever purposely teach your children, nobody who's a Christian anyway, that money and success matter more than Christ and relationships. But if we're not careful, because we do constantly teach our children, we can teach them that. They should see the importance of God's word as we live. That's why he said to uh, put it between your eyes and on your wrists. And that's why he said, and mark it on the posts of 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 the doors of your house. Have you ever really thought about this? About how few instincts human beings have compared to animals. I mean, beavers don't have to be taught to make dams. Birds don't have to be taught by their parents on how to make a nest. I mean, they they don't have to be taught any of those things. God programmed that in them, but he did not program things in human beings. We have a fallen nature, and we start out and stay helpless for a very long time because God intended parents to teach their children some things to teach them to do what they might not otherwise naturally do. And obviously, if we're going to teach our children these things, we must know them first ourselves. By the way, great job being here or listening in, if you're listening in. Uh, uh, God wants us to learn, to be able to teach. Uh, Many of you have watched the show, uh, King of the Hill, um, at first I thought it was kind of dopey because the cartooning's poor, but the writing is, is outstanding. And in the cartoon, uh, King of the Hill, there's a character, uh, his name is Lucky. He's got long hair. He is not, uh, he's, he has no job. He doesn't wear a watch and he makes his living suing companies, uh, that he had accidents, uh, at on their property. Now, he's a nice guy. He's just incredibly lazy, no motivation at all. And his dad had taught him uh, never have anything other than a wallet, uh, cash, and a lucky poker chip. Well, when uh, Lucky's wife, who happens to be this guy named Hank's uh, niece, uh, when she gets pregnant, uh, Lucky comes to Hank, and he wants Hank to teach him uh, how to handle himself and raise his child. I mean, he didn't have a driver's license. He didn't have a social security number. He didn't have a credit card. He didn't have an insurance card. He didn't have anything because that's all he was taught. Uh, But thank God he had enough sense to find somebody from whom he could learn. And, And that's what I would say to you. Listen, if you were not taught all these things we're going to go over in this parenting class, listen, Find someone who knows and learn them. Don't relegate yourself to only being able to uh, teach what your parents taught you. But before we talk about what to teach our children first, we ought to honestly face this issue of how do I teach them? I hope you understand, we most often and most commonly, we teach our children by our example. There's no amount of things we can say that outweighs what we do. One of my favorite, if not my ultimate favorite saying, is what you say, what you do, speak so loudly that I cannot hear what you say. And you could summarize all that as teaching by example. Do you know when is our example most powerful? Do you think our example is most powerful when all is well? I mean, absolutely not. Our example is most powerful and loudest when we're in some kind of trouble, some adversity, some difficulty. Unfortunately, for many people, it's times like that when there's adversity or trouble or difficulty when they most often abandon what they claim to believe, which means that we're teaching our children something different than what we claim to believe. 
because they're watching our example. If we're not careful, we'll teach them, uh, don't use profanity unless you're angry. If we're not careful, we'll teach them, be honest with the cashier unless they make a big mistake and give you a lot of extra change. Uh, Listen to the pastor unless he says something you don't like. Respect the police until they pull you over for speeding. Treat people with respect unless you had a bad day or they disrespect you first. Uh, Be committed to the church unless something else important is going on. Obey the Bible unless it costs you money or friends or lowers your social status. You know, again, uh, I kind of mock those things, but I hope by example we are teaching our children the right things when we're facing adversity and difficulty. But it isn't just that we teach our children uh, first and most often by our example. We also teach our children on occasional moments when they're open to being taught. In case you hadn't noticed, most of the time your children are not open to being taught. And sort of the older they get, the less frequently those occasions occur. By the way, don't be too critical if your children are not open to being taught from you. Uh, Remember, you were really not very open to being taught by your parents, and it's a lot more to do with their age and immaturity than you most of the time. By the way, if they only learn on occasional moments uh, when they're open, that means our time with them matters. And so I have a, always good quality time with my kids. I, I do think you ought to have quality time with your kids. But listen, uh, if they're only open to learning on occasional moments when they're open, uh, the amount of time you spend with them matters too because the more you're there, the more you're likely to be there when they are open to being taught. By the way, when do you think your children are most open to being taught? Do you suppose it's when all is well? Of course not. Uh, They're just like us. They're most open to learning when there's some problem, some difficulty, some adversity, something's not going well for them. It is those times that are the most teachable moments in their life, just like for you and me. Uh, maybe what that means is it's not a good goal as a parent to take as much adversity out of my child's life as possible. Keep them from all situations where they might have difficulty with someone. You, You know, that is a good way to raise an immature, stunted adult. See, those times are the times when They're most open to learning, and we most are able to teach them. We teach them by our example. We teach them in occasional moments when they're open to learning. We teach them key things by repetition. I mean, repetition is a key teaching tool uh, that God uses in the Bible. In case you hadn't noticed, uh, there might be, I'm just going to pick a number, 20 key things in, in the Bible And God teaches us those 20 key things over and over and over again by a lot of different methods and and, and ways. Repetition is a key tool for a parent, too. And the time, the kind of teaching that we most often think of, I'm just going to mention last, uh, we don't often weigh our example heavily enough. We don't often talk and think about those occasional moments when they're open heavily enough. We don't think about repetitive and repetition enough. You know, we also should make some on-purpose time to teach them. I mean, verse 9, thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and thy gates. That's kind of, that's an on-purpose thing you do to teach them the words of God. Do you make any on-purpose time to teach your children the things of God? Do you have any on-purpose time set aside to teach them about character and how their character impacts their life now? Now, in my opinion, if you're in the church every time the door squeaks, 
Uh, I don't think you need 30 or 40 minutes a day for family devotions. I mean, if you want to do that, go for it. Uh, Sharon and I always felt like, you know, our children were in Sunday school. They were in children's church during the Sunday, during the 11 o'clock hour. Uh, they were sitting in church with us on Sunday night. They were in uh, Wednesday night kids' programs. Uh, we felt like with that being the case, you know, we didn't need 30 or 40 minutes a day. That mainly they needed our example. Uh, so really when they were young, uh, I would tuck them in at night and I would tell them a Bible story. We would make some point and teach that point and we'd pray together. When they, when they were older, uh, we would get them up 15 minutes early for school. Uh, we'd sit around the breakfast table and we would read the Bible together. Uh, we'd just uh, go around three times reading one verse apiece, and then I would make some comment that was, you know, 60 or 90 seconds long most of the time, and uh, that was our family devotions. Uh, now, if you want to do 30 or four minutes, uh, 40 minutes, go for it. Um, but you and I have an obligation uh, from our Creator to teach the children uh, the things of God uh, diligently. Uh, yes, make use of Sunday school. Yes, uh, get them in children's church. Yes, get them in Wednesday night kids' program. Yes, get them in team ministry. Those are all things God gave us to help us as parents, not compete against us as parents, to help us a as parents and uh, teach them on purpose, which brings up this great question that is the focus of our lesson for today. What should I teach them First, it's a great question. I mean, certainly the Bible teaches the importance of loving others. It teaches the importance of becoming comfortable with the way God made and gifted us. It teaches both the danger and importance of how we handle and look at our heart and how to consider those who are different from us. But in the end, those all come from the Bible well, what should be my first focus as a parent? What should I first teach my child about the Word of God and life? And here it is. Our Creator wants parents to first teach their children to obey rightful authority. Do you know the first thing God taught Adam was to obey him? He was Adam's father. I mean, God commanded him to uh, replenish the earth. He commanded him to be fruitful and multiply. Commanded him not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because in the day that he did that, that he would surely die. That was the first thing God taught Adam. He didn't mention his love uh, all the way up until Deuteronomy chapter 4, uh, long after the Garden of Eden, uh, 40 years after the Ten Commandments. Uh, uh, listen, uh, teach them to obey rightful authority. Uh, turn up a few pages in your Bible to Deuteronomy chapter 11. Uh, teach them to obey God. Notice in Deuteronomy 11 verse 26, uh, he says, Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse, a blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day. So what did God say he'd do if you obey his commandments? He said he'd bless you. Verse 28, says, And a curse, if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to go after other gods which ye have not known. Notice, if you disobey, God says, uh, you'll bring a curse in your life. And for those who just sit here or listen in and think, well, that's just the Old Testament. Uh, Jesus said in Luke 6, 46, Why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Jesus expected people to obey his commands. Uh, Jesus said in John 15, 14, Ye are my friends if you keep whatsoever I command you. He said in John 14, 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. Listen, if you and I fail to teach our children to obey God, we bring the curse of God in their life. I don't want that. I don't just not want that for myself. I don't want it for my children. I don't want that in their health. I don't want that in their relationships. I don't want that in their workplace. I don't want that with their finances. I, I want any 
thing they, I, I want as much of God's blessing in their life and in their spiritual service as is possible. See, if we teach our children to obey God, we not only close the door to the curse of God, we open the door to his blessing, and I want that. I want that. And by the way, loving one another is obedience to God. Well, let me ask you as a parent, what's the real priority of obedience to God as you raise your children? What are you teaching them with your example uh, as they watch you make your life choices as you face adversity and difficulty? But it isn't just that we teach them to obey, obey God. Go in your Bible to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, in verse 1, it says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. Teach them to obey you as parents. Listen, I want my children to live as long uh, as God will allow them to live, rather than to have their life shortened. Now, this doesn't mean that everybody's going to live into their 80s. It just means that people shorten their life by disobeying their parents. I don't want that. By the way, I hope you're getting the idea that it hurts our children really badly if we fail to teach them to obey God or obey us as their parents. Listen, our children will naturally only want to obey you and I as a parent when they feel like it. But it is our job as parents to teach them to obey God and to obey us. Let me ask you, how much effort do you make to make your children obey you as a parent? Uh, you've turned in lots and lots of questions about uh, discipline. We will uh, get to those, of, of course, uh, but... What value do you place on obedience in your home? Remember, God knew that no parent would be perfect, and yet he still commanded children to obey their own parents. But it isn't just to obey God and to obey you as their parent. Turn in your Bible to Hebrews chapter 13. Again, you, 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 you could argue that one of the main themes of the, the whole Bible is obedience. Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give an account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. I mean, those that have the rule over you, according to verse 7, are those who speak unto you the word of God whose faith we are to follow. Those who have rule over you in this context are the people who are watching for your souls. Uh, listen, uh, teach them to obey spiritual authorities in their life. I, I want my children to have their soul watched out for. I, wanted them, I want them to have, uh, be profited, to be bettered by the spiritual relationship with the leaders God has brought in the circle of their life. Listen, my children following and obeying and respecting other uh, spiritual leaders, it doesn't diminish me as a parent. They're there to help me and come alongside me as a parent. And if you view uh, them as competition for you, you're going to hurt your child. Uh, again, you could argue one of the most prominent themes of the, all, all the Bible is obedience. Turn back a few pages just to uh, Titus uh, chapter uh, 3. Titus chapter 3. Notice what it says in Titus 3.1. It says, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. Teach them to obey proper authority and government. Go back a few more pages to Colossians chapter 3. And uh, it says there in verse 22 in Colossians, oh, I missed it. Uh, Philippians, Colossians 3, verse 22. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart fearing God. You say, why should I do that? My boss is a jerk. Uh, verse 23, whatsoever you do, do it hardly as to the Lord 
and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance. For you serve the Lord Christ. In, in everything we do, we, we are doing it really for the Lord. And, and I guess there are uh, probably human representatives uh, in every area of our life uh, that represent the Lord, sometimes badly, but they do represent the Lord, and we do what we do for the Lord. These authorities are not necessarily smarter. They're not necessarily more spiritual. Uh, they're not necessarily better than us. And listen, uh, it's obvious sometimes they're worse. But, but simply put, these people in these positions have been given some of God's authority in a specific area of life. Uh, remember, they don't have authority to do something contrary to what God wants. God gave them authority to do what he wants. I mean, over and over and over, this theme shows up in the scriptures. Obey 69 times, obeyed 41 times, obedience 12 times, follow 86 times, followed 41 times, uh, following uh, 108 times, lead 60 times, led 68 times, submit 15 times. And, and those are just those words. It's taught in other ways, many, many other places. It's a prominent theme. But it's not a popular thing. It goes against the grain of our culture. It goes against the grain of our flesh. Please don't hear that I'm telling you to teach your children to be mind-numbed robots. I would say do not do that. I am saying that you and I better teach our children first to obey rightful authority, with, starting with God and then you as a parent. If you force me to pick the most important thing we teach our children, this will be it. I mean, listen, obeying the authority of God, that covers all kinds of area of life. Think about it. If your children can't obey rightful authority, uh, they will never be useful citizens. They will never be productive employees. They will be in constant trouble in school, constant trouble with the police, constant trouble in your home. They will be in constant trouble in their marriage. Uh, listen, it is the degradation of obedience to rightful authority as a foundational problem in our culture today. That is, that, that is why this is a focus of Satan's attack. And the average person even sitting in a church does not understand or value properly obedience to rightful authority. If you force me to tell, say, pick the most important thing, this would be it. Teach your children to obey rightful authority. If you ask me what is the hardest thing that we teach our children, I would say this would be it. I mean, it is completely against the grain of our fallen nature, completely against the grain of our culture. And let's just be honest, we have some fears. We, we don't want to teach this because we know, most often by experience, that some people in rightful authority, they're not using their authority in a way that pleases God. How do you handle that? You see, we need to teach them that all obedience must be filtered through obedience to God. He is the ultimate authority. Because remember, the goal of parenting is not a good child. There are a lot, again, I've known thousands of children over the years, uh, the, the, <laughs> hundreds of which were good children but bad adults. The goal is not a good child, though we love it when we have one. The goal is a godly, faithful, functional, independent adult. And by the grace of God, you can produce that today if you will apply what our Creator teaches us. Which brings up a good question. What are some practical ways for how to teach our children to obey rightful authority? That's a good question. And that is where we will start next week. Uh, please turn in your written questions. 
Uh, turn in your surveys if you've not yet done so. Uh, I'm in the process of correlating them. Uh, God bless you. You are dismissed.